And welcome back. Tom Harmon here with you. And uh, on the line with us for our Conversations with Great Minds, this hour we're going to be speaking with, we are speaking with, William Hoagland. William Hoagland is a writer and speaker on American History for Grown-Ups. This is going to be a fascinating conversation. He's the author of several books. His latest is Founding Finance, How Debt Speculation, Foreclosures, Protests, and Crackdowns Made Us a Nation, forward by Mark Crispin Miller. He's also an occasional banjo picker. And uh, Amazon says, uh, William Hoagland writes and speaks on startling connections between American history and today's political and cultural studies. And uh, we'll, we can go, go into that at some length. Uh, William Hoagland, welcome to the program. Thanks, Tom. Great to be with you. Thank you for joining us. Um, in Founding Finance, you talk about the early financial debates and battles, not between the United States and the British East India Company, like what sparked the 1773 Boston Tea Party, but about the, the this this crucible, this this fight to define wh- what America is financially. Can, can, uh, please correct me if I'm mischaracterizing this, and, and uh, can you riff on that a little? Yeah, I mean, you characterize it perfectly. I make a big point, and I've been trying to do this for some time, of trying to shift the, the, the discussion of the founding away, and this may sound counterintuitive and indeed, you know, insane to some people, but away from the uh, well-known struggles uh, of Americans against England, um, which we're, we, we continue to revive and rehearse and go over, um, you know, we won that war. Uh, I feel like there's a, another war, which is the struggles uh, among, among Americans, some Americans versus other Americans, that connect very directly with with things we fight about today, um, and we would do well to know more about how we struggle with each other over things that, you know, we can sum up in the word finance, which sometimes sounds a little boring to some people, but actually, you know, my very lengthy subtitle that you, that you read there um, kind of says what I'm talking about when I, when I say finance. I'm talking about, you know, beyond the subtitle, we couldn't fit everything I wanted to say in the subtitle, you know, debts, public and private, the lending industry, regulation, uh, wealth concentration or democratic approaches to wealth, um, foreclosures, um, taxes, and all the things that we argue about so strenuously today. So I think there's, a, there's another fight uh, that went on that we have spent a lot of time denying um, that was not the fight with England, but a fight with ourselves. And I think we still, are, we still haven't resolved that fight. So, for example, we just saw a housing bubble pop, and there are... There are a lot of theories about what was, you know, what originated that that housing bubble. There was a similar housing bubble that popped in 1927, um, that had started in 1921 down in Florida. Um, there were housing bubbles and crashes at the founding of this country. How did debt, you know, what what brought these about? How did we react to them? What was the debate about? And was there a similar to debate to, uh, you know, on this program frequently? I'll get a libertarian on, and they'll say. Oh, we just need to get government off, you know, off the backs of everything. No regulation. Everything will be fine. The free market will solve all problems because uh, all good business people want to have a good reputation, uh, you know, and uh, that kind of thing. Uh, yeah, well, there was. It's, it's very little discussed um, sort of in the, in the most popular and the most influential parts of, of our cultural discussions about the founding. But um, there was, uh, it, it was not exactly a housing bubble like our own housing bubble, of course, because everything was quite different back then. But there sure. was a a land price bubble, you could call it, like a house price bubble, um, really kind of mad speculation in, in real estate, uh, western land it was called, and of course there was this in, immense desire on the part of some parts of the population to expand into the western part of the continent. Um, and, th- and, and when we say the west, uh, we always have to remember that we're talking about the 18th century, so you know, Pittsburgh was a, far, a fairly far western outpost. Right. Ohio was the extreme west. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So. Um, but but it had certain quality. That that area had certain qualities that we Americans have always associated with their West, a certain wildness and a certain uh, distance from the centers of power. So uh, you get a conflict there where you've got Eastern uh, Eastern speculators and landowners um, buying up as much land as they could um, in the hopes of um, renting it to tenants who would then do the hard work of like you know busting the soil and creating uh, uh, usable pr- property and then. The, then the eastern speculators would either become absentee landlords of those tenants or flip it um, for profits. And because the market was so insane, uh, the, the, the dreams were so vast, 
it was very much like uh, some of our more recent uh, speculative bubbles. Now, this was in the 1780s, 1790s, 1800s? That uh, I'm talking about starting in the 17... Well, I would say I'm, st- I'm talking about starting in the, uh, before the Revolution, actually, mm-hmm. and going right through. And this is a, a good example of where we're so revolution-centric that we think of things as sort of either being before or after the Revolution. Right. Everything would have changed. But actually... You know, well before the Revolution, um, if you think about a family like the Livingston family, for example, who owned millions of acres in, up, in New York, not so far upstate, actually, in, on the Hudson, in the Hudson, along the Hudson. Mm-hmm. I mean, they called it the Manor, and you can today, today go to Livingston Manor, and it was run in, in large part, and this is before the Revolution, a large part like a medieval manor. I mean, it was a, fe- a somewhat feudal operation with tenant farming going on there. And this is, you know, we have this idea that there was this um, sort of in the free, clean air of the new world, all um, sort of elite, elite versus ordinary uh, distinctions among people broke down. Uh, whereas, in fact, you know, well before the revolution, there was an American, a strong American elite. Uh, and the Livingstons are a great example. And many of those elites became the great revolutionary leaders. The Livingstons, again, are a good example. Um, and so uh, this, these are the kinds of conflicts that are today little discussed um, and that lend throw throw certain strange lights on the founding as as it actually took place politically, especially around these economic and financial issues, which have to do with real estate bubbles and things like that that are actually quite familiar to us today. Strauss and Howe, in their book *The Fourth Turning*, suggest that there are about every year, eighty years, there's a crash, and that there was a crash of sorts that led to the American Revolutionary War. Um, was there? If so, what, what, what was the nature of it in the 1760s, 1770s? Uh, well, yeah, there, uh, there were, I think there were, a, I, I would think that there were a number of different crashes and they might have had more regional characteristics than we would necessarily expect today. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but one of the things that interests me when it comes to um, the, the historian Terry, and I don't know how to pronounce his last name, even though I've been in touch with him, Bouton or Boughton, mm-hmm. whether it's like the baseball player or whether it's more French-sounding. But uh, he's done some great work on um, foreclosure crises uh, throughout the founding period, where he has a very poignant um, description of the sheriff's wagon, just you know, throwing people out of their houses, um, foreclosing on their property, their property being then owned essentially by their creditors, the, the property being auctioned up for sale. And um, this was, the way he describes it, this was a, a widespread problem. Uh, depression really, um, which people in those days called not a depression, but a, ordinary people called a scarcity of money. Right, or a panic. Like a pretty good description in some ways. Yeah. Uh, now, now, did this result in a demand by, by the, the, this was pre-revolution, but by the Americans, by the, by the you know, for government regulation? Well, I think one of the interesting uh, subjects we get into when we start looking at how uh, demands for regulation played out in the revolutionary period um, is that, I mean, everybody, I'd say on all sides, there was, a, there was something of a, of a less libertarian understanding uh, than you know, the, one you just, the one you just kind of cited. Um, I think many people knew that government um, would regulate, and the question would be kind of on whose behalf would it regulate. Right. Um, Many, you know, uh, many of the elites of the period, the, the high financiers who became great revolutionaries, Robert Morris, the superintendent of finance, his protege, Alexander Hamilton, and even people who later got associated with, um, very closely associated with libertarianism, like the young James Madison, um, all wanted, uh, all were involved in trying to build nationhood on funding a, a, a public debt. Which is to say, you know, enriching the investing class and connecting the investing class of the country, the great wealth of the country, to nationhood, to great national projects. Let's, I, I, I want to continue this conversation. We, we have to take a break. We're talking with William Hoagland, his new book, Founding Finance. This is the Tom Hartman Program. And his website, William Hoagland, H O G E L A N D dot WordPress dot com. We'll be right back.
And uh, welcome back. Uh, William Hoagland, you're still with us? I am still here. Great. Okay. Um, let's, uh, if, if you don't mind, uh, during this, we have a four-minute break here uh, before we rejoin our commercial stations, and our, all of our non-commercial stations are with us, our Pacifica affiliates and our Free Speech TV. So let's pick up a call here. Da- Davis is watching us on Free Speech TV on Dish Network in York, Pennsylvania. You have a question for, for William Hoagland? Yes. Uh, hi. I have a question for both of y'all. During the last, like, 15, 20 years, Americans have seen foreclosures, um, just jobs being taken away, and just Wall Street and these corporate giants just getting away with everything. And I feel that me and other Americans are at the point that we feel we can't do nothing. We occupied Wall Street. We try to make a voice heard, and it seems like nothing is really getting done. It seems like they want it to stay this way. Okay. Uh, William Hoagland. Well, in terms of uh, the kinds of things I write about, um, one thing I'll say about founding finance and about the research I've done on this um, is that the story is not always the story of our history in this regard. Um, is often a very serious one, uh, sometimes not an uplifting one. And I don't think that we can look back to our founding to find solutions to the kinds of, you know, intense and serious problems that the caller is referring to that are affecting, you know, people's lives every day. Mm-hmm. Um, I do think that, the, I don't think that means there's nothing we can do, but one of my sort of, one of the things I'm fairly obsessed with is criticizing the idea that, that in order to solve those problems, we just need to get back to some version of our founding. I would prefer to imagine that we could begin to move on a little bit and address those problems seriously. And I think when we constantly invoke our founding, we're just distracting ourselves from the very painful things that the caller is bringing up. When Jefferson suggested that the Constitution should be revisited in a serious way every 19 years, every generation, and that it would be absurd for uh, uh, an adult to wear the clothing that he wore as a young man uh, as an example, was that a sentiment that was widely held, or was he a, a lone voice with regard to that? Uh, well, Jefferson's always hard to use as an example of anything representative. Because he took so many positions over the course of his life on so yeah, many things. He so. really did. He took so many positions, and because he was so such an interesting thinker, actually, yeah. he took many kind of idiosyncratic positions. Yes. Um, I think it's kind of well known that most of the... Um, it's kind of accepted, I guess, that most of the... Um, framers of the Constitution were pushing, who were wanting to get it ratified did not imagine that it would last. Uh, they, they all had problems with it. Um, yeah. you know, they, did, they disagreed about what the problems were, but they all thought, well, you know, this is the best we're going to get now. Let's just get this. Right. And they'd all seen the Articles of Confederacy come and go, too. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, I don't know that Jefferson's 19, you know, I don't know that anyone else had that exact idea, but I don't, and I don't know that that many, that some of them pragmatically would have thought it was a good idea to keep revisiting it in that way. Um, yeah. But I don't think they expected it to last the way it has. That's that's very interesting. The the this whole idea of originalism and uh, you know it's uh, this, this uh, I want to say false nostalgia, but it it seems like it's you know it animates the Tea Party and whatnot. Um, this idea that somehow the founders were divinely inspired and absolutely correct. I'll, I'll get into that right after the break, if we can. We're talking with William Hoagland. His book, his new book, Founding Finance, is out. It's available now. You can check it out on you know in your local bookstore, or your favorite online bookstores, wherever it may be. William Hoagland is with us with our for our conversation of the Great Minds Hour here today on this on this Wednesday. And we also will be taking calls in the second half hour of the program. If you have a question for Mr. Hoagland, uh, give us a call at uh, 866-987-THOM is our telephone number. Um, the, this concept of originalism that is championed by people like Anthony Scalia, uh, where you know, the other day he was saying, uh, you know, of course uh, gay marriage is not, uh, uh, not constitutional. It was never, you know, of course abortion should, you know, could be illegal because the founders. Uh, it, it's almost like there's this, this notion that, A, the founders were monolithic, B, that they were brilliant and divinely inspired, and C, that if we just got back to these core principles that they held, everything would be wonderful. I mean, this is kind of the animating concept, precept of the, of the Tea Party. Is this crazy? Well, I, I think it's wrong. Uh, okay. Um, and maybe it goes to something a little more interesting than just wrong in the sense that, you know, what is it about us as a people, 
this is a question I have, do not have an answer to. It's a question I raise in Founding Finance and have raised elsewhere. I mean, I'm just very interested in what it is about us as a people um, that makes us see our founding in this monolithic, as you just described it, with monoli- mono- as a monolith and as, a, and as sort of perfect in its original essence. Um, and, yeah, I think there's something crazy about that or something... Uh, worth exploring as kind of almost a, per, a personality of the of the a personality issue in the country, mm-hmm. and and what its sources are, um, are you know I think is an open question. I, I'd like to say though also that um, that that liberals can be originalists too, mm-hmm. and I, I think it's 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 just as much of a problem in a way because we also hear from from liberals from the left. We've heard from Occupy uh, claims upon the founding that, you know, if we just get back to what they were really all about, um, then we will have the right answers. We just disagree so extremely on what they were really all about. And every time you're trying to, you know, go to the Constitution to say your argument is the constitutional argument and your opponent's argument is unconstitutional, it seems to me you're trying to just stop the conversation. You know, you're not only wrong on policy, you're wrong on some fundamental basic principle. And I think we should be doing the opposite now. I think we should be carrying out the conversation on its merits and not just trying to beat each other over the head with this giant stick we call the Constitution. Now, your book is, your most recent book, Founding Finance. There's a, uh, you know, the old cliche that goes back to uh, Mr. Felt, the uh, FBI guy who was uh, deep throat for, for Woodward and Bernstein, follow the money. That, that it seems that the history of nations is really the history of money. Uh, to what extent was finance the history of early America? How, how did finance affect the, the shaping of early America? Well, that to me is like the great question, because I, I used to say I was trying to sort of complicate the founding story. That's what, you know, it's the polite term that's frequently used. Um, and, and kind of bring nuance to it by bringing these economic and financial issues in. But I actually have come to think, you know, everybody, to, to a hammer, everything looks like a nail, and what you study ends up affecting what you see. And I'm keenly aware of that. But I do think that, we, that, that we've obsessively left finance out of the story over the past, say, 60 years or so of the founding story. And more and more I feel like what was on the minds of people at the time, whether we're talking about ordinary people who actually in the 18th century I think were quite financially savvy compared to many people today, or whether we're talking about the high financiers or the great students of Republican government and framers of government, finance was, you know, on their minds. In fact, I think it's what brought them together. I think it's what brought the, the sort of the liberty types and the, uh, and the, the sort of more activist government types together into the Constitutional Convention. I think they were concerned about um, finance, and when I say finance, I mean they were concerned to stop, obstruct, and suppress more democratic approaches to finance. And in terms of the first thing you brought up, I mean, yeah, uh, follow the money. Um, Nationhood, a nation state, as it was conceived in the 18th century, would have in a way had to, if it was going to be a real nation, involve some sort of concentration of money and power through money. So how that would have gone differently is one of, you know, that's, that's the great sort of seething conflict that I try to write about in Founding Finance. But, but in the end, nationhood, I think, our nationhood, I think, did devolve uh, on a concentration of wealth. How different is the modern concept of a central bank and a national currency from the conceptualization of that at the founding of this country and the debate between, for example, Hamilton and Jefferson, or Hamilton and a lot of other people about whether, you know, that ultimately ended up with, what, Andrew Jackson going off nuts on this thing. Um, or not nuts, but, I mean, you know, going off politically on it. Um, with regard to there being a, a, a bank and a single currency. We have a minute to the break, by the way. Uh, well, you know, the, the fight over the bank between Hamilton and Madison is a, is a well-known fight. Madison. Um, I think what's, what gets left out of that fight um, where Hamilton wanted one and Madison thought it was unconstitutional, <laughs> just what we were talking about before. What we get left out of that fight, uh, I think, is that Hamilton's desire to have a central bank was predicated in part precisely on this idea of trying to obstruct uh, deconcentrations of wealth that were going on around the country. Um, and so central banking does not have to mean that, and I think there were alternatives uh, to, to that approach to central banking. But I, what we leave out of, of that story tends to be the desire for a central bank uh, Hamilton's desire for a central bank was largely predicated on a desire to obstruct democratic approaches to finance. 
Small D Democratic. Yeah, small D. I should always say I'm always talking small D. Yeah. Thanks for that. And and what are the, what were those small D Democratic approaches to finance? Oh well, they wanted to devalue, for example, um, public debt and private debt through issuing paper money that would depreciate, uh, building a kind of debt relief um, into into currency. Was this for they domestic wanted... debt relief or to screw the French? <laughs> Sorry, say that again. It was this for domestic debt relief or to screw the French that we owed so I'm much money about to. Domestic mm. debt relief, and I'm talking about what the what the elites felt was that they were going to screw the elites, the American elite. Uh huh. Okay. We will continue right after a six-minute break for the news here with William Hoagland. 